Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I want to talk about some classics that are absolute page turners. There's this idea that classics as a whole are pretty dull, that like the only reason why you might want to read a classic is to explore the themes and the ideas and the philosophies contained within, which is obviously nonsense. Classics are stories first and foremost, and many of them have captured the imaginations of readers for centuries. Many of them are driven by plot. They can be fast paced and action packed. And that's the kind of books that I want to talk about today. And I want to recommend to you today. So first, a quick disclaimer. As a reader, I generally prefer the other type of book. I prefer the novels that are uh, character studies, that are sort of slow placed, explorations of the intricacies of the human character, uh, the complication of relationships, society novels, that kind of thing. I don't mind if basically nothing happens in a book except people feeling things and then talking about those feelings or more likely than not, not talking about those feelings. But that's not what this video is about. So there won't be any Ian Forster or Oscar Wilde or Jane Austen in this. I've got eight recommendations to share with you and they're not sorted in any way, but we'll start with a couple of Victorian classics. The first one is Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon and this was published in 1862. This is the story of a woman with a secret. Shocker, I know. This book is often listed as the prime example of the so-called sensation novel, which became very popular for a while in the second half of the 19th century, and I believe particularly in the 60s and 70s of that century. Sensation novels of that time explored themes and topics that were, you guessed it, sensational. Think crime, secrets, double lives, dangerous romances, all the things that if you combine them into a book, are pretty damn tasty. There are some parallels with gothic romances of earlier decades, but I find that gothic novels rely a lot more on the atmosphere, whereas Lady Audley's Secret combines that sense of creepiness with a very fast moving plot that's full of fun and adventure. Because we're talking about Victorians, there's this thin layer of moral instruction uh, above all of it. Like the book is saying, Look at what these horrible, godless people are capable of. Look, are you looking? Are you looking? Are you scandalized? Which, in my opinion, only adds to the entertainment value of the book. Lady Audley's Secret is an absolute romp from start to finish. We follow a young man who's thrown right into a mystery as he attempts to uncover what happened to his friend who mysteriously and very suddenly vanished. But along the way, he uncovers many other secrets hiding in the gloomy world of his uncle's ancestral home. Because of course it is. So right from the start, we know that Lady Audley who is his uncle's sexy young wife, a woman who's ascended from being a mere governess to the ranks of the minor aristocracy. We know that she's involved. He knows that she's involved, but how exactly? What is Lady Audley's secret? Well, you'll have to read the book to find out. I think if we were to try and categorize this novel into a genre familiar to us today, it would be a crime mystery with elements of thriller. So if you enjoy those genres, you might just like this Victorian classic too. There's a detective, albeit an unwilling one in this case, who follows up on clues, who investigates crime scenes, who interviews people. There's a whole host of intriguing characters, all with their own little problems and not so little secrets. There's mystery and romance and adventure. It's all in all a very fun read. And if you want to know more about this book, I have actually recorded a complete but spoiler free review, which you'll find linked in the description box. The second book I want to recommend is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. This was published in 1848. And this is the story of a woman with a secret. In my humble but correct opinion. This is one of the most underrated Victorian classics by the most underrated of the Bronte sisters. It's an epistolary no- It's an epistolary- <laughs> It's an epistolary novel, which means that it's written entirely in letters and primarily actually in diary entries. This too starts with a mystery, in this case an intriguing and beautiful young widow who moves into a gloomy old manor house, of course, with her child and starts making a living for herself as an artist. Immediately, she's the topic of village gossip. And as we go deeper into the book, we discover her secret and the story of what brought her 
to that place at that time. While this novel on the surface shares many similarities with Lady Audley's Secret, it's decidedly more bleak. Uh, a lot of that is because the darkness, the horrors, the moral depravity that propel the plot of this book are much more mundane, much more everyday. Whereas Lady Audley's Secret is really reveling in the sensational, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall explores the pain and the suffering that's hidden in normal society, the horrors that happen behind closed doors. It's a much more sober book, but it's just as much of a page turner. The epi <laughs> The epistolary style, especially in the parts that are written as diary entries, make it easy for us to empathize with the protagonist in a really close, direct way, which is part of the page-turning appeal. This reads paradoxically both as a very modern and a very Victorian novel. The story itself, the realism of it, the frank and open way in which the protagonist's life is described, might have been written in the 21st century. But overlaying it all is of course that prevailing sense of 19th century morality, which is a bit less familiar to the modern reader. Still, if you're after a book that's dark and bleak but very hard to put down, I think you'd get a lot out of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. I've previously made a short video about this book, which you'll also find linked in the description box. We move on to the very end of the Victorian era, and my next recommendation is The Hound of the Baskervilles by Arthur Conan Doyle, which was published in 1901. This is the story of a dog with a secret. All right, this is kind of uh, a placeholder for Sherlock Holmes books in general, because all of them read in a similar fashion, uh, both the novels and the short story collections, in that they are very much plot-driven books. But I'm picking The Hound of the Baskervilles because I think it's the best of the four Sherlock Holmes novels, and it's a perfect Holmes story to dive into this world of detective fiction if you're new to it. It almost feels silly to try and summarize this book because it's so iconic that even if you haven't read it, you probably know at least in some part what it's about. There's the brilliant detective Sherlock Holmes, whose powers of deduction make it very hard for those around him to keep their secrets. Then there's his long-suffering, gun-toting sidekick Dr. Watson, who trails along and records their adventures for posterity. Where many other Sherlock Holmes stories are set in London, this case takes us out to the countryside, where our protagonists are asked to investigate the curse of the Baskerville family, who for generations seem to be getting killed by a mysterious supernatural hellhound haunting the misty hills of Dartmoor, where their family estate is situated. So Holmes and Watson travel there with the latest heir to the estate to find out what's going on. This book is so much fun. It's one of those books that are incredible to read for the first time because like any good detective story, this will have you guessing along, trying to untangle the various interlocking mysteries, picking up on clues and hints, figuring out who's lying and who's telling the truth, and what on earth Sherlock Holmes is making of all of this. At the same time, it is quite action-packed. There's knights out on the moors, there's gunfights, there's traps and stalkers and all of that good stuff. This book is single-handedly responsible for so many of the tropes that we adore in detective fiction of today. It's a short read and one that I can guarantee will have you on the edge of your seat. Perfect, I think, for this time of year as well, when it's cold and gloomy and dark outside and... I did a short video about this some years ago, and I've also made a video about where to start with Sherlock Holmes. So if you haven't read any Holmes books, I'd recommend you uh, check that out to get an overview of the canon. Both videos are linked down below. My next recommendation is The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith, and we're jumping into the year 1955 with this one, and right into a psychological thriller classic. This one has all the makings of a page-turner, a charismatic protagonist who will do anything to get his own way, the beautiful backdrop of luxurious Italian beaches, and a whole lot of repressed sexuality turned violent. This is one of those books that I can't really talk about in any amount of detail without giving too much away, but let me try. The main premise is the talented Mr. Ripley, a young American with no money but a whole lot of charisma, is commissioned by an older businessman to travel to Italy and try and bring back his wayward son. 
The son in question, however, has no intentions at all of leaving the life of luxury and leisure and is having a grand old time in his Italian summer house on the beach. And then things happen. Could I be any more ominous? Things happen and Ripley finds himself on the run and having to use his aforementioned talents in order to survive. This book is absolutely delicious in the way that it mixes darkness and violence and obsession with a really nail-biting, page-turning, hair-raising plot of a thriller. Like all good psychological thrillers, the plot of this is driven by the characters and the protagonist here, Ripley, is really fascinating and someone you want to read more about even as you are horrified by some of the things that go on inside his head. As the reader, we are thrown right into the action, into the twisted minds of the characters and the backdrop of luxury and glamour. And all of that is just an irresistible mix that make this book very hard to put down. This is a novel I recommend to people who like modern thrillers but are a bit wary of classics. There is a familiarity here in the way the book is written which makes it easy to get into despite the fact that it's very nearly 70 years old. My fifth recommendation is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier from 1938. Unlike most of the other books in this list, I would consider this one to be driven more by character than plot. I know the distinction is inadequate and wishy-washy at best and very subjective. But what I mean is that this book is quite slow paced, quite introspective, in particular compared with some of the others I've recommended so far. But it is still an absolute page turner, which is why I decided to include it. This is the story of a woman with a secret. That's not quite right. This is a book absolutely drenched in mystery. Every secret is shrouded in 10 layers of misdirection and every character has a secret. Right from the beginning, we're introduced to the main character, who's a young woman by the name of... Well, we don't even know that. In fact, we barely know anything about the protagonist. Yes. Which is quite remarkable, considering this book is narrated in first person. We know that she's young and somewhat naive, but we know nothing at all about her background. We don't even know her first name. All we know is that at the beginning of the book, she gets married to a rich middle-aged widower called Mr. De Winter. And she soon finds herself moving into his ancestral home, of course, which is a Gothic manor house on the coast of Cornwall. A lot of the book is about her finding her feet and trying to become secure in this new life as his second wife. The first wife, whose name is, you guessed it, Rebecca, haunts this book like a ghost. Not a literal one, this is not a supernatural story, but her presence is everywhere from the title of the book to the behavior of every single character in it. The protagonist in this novel is decidedly not a detective type. She doesn't want to uncover the mysteries of her husband's first wife. She just wants to live her life in as much comfort as possible. But Rebecca draws her in and soon she finds herself unable to escape their connection. If this summary is as vague as you've ever heard, there's a reason for that. Just like with the previous book, it's hard to talk about this one without giving too much away. It's a dark novel with twists and turns, but it's also quite introspective and atmospheric and absolutely irresistible. Rebecca is one of those books that gets hyped a lot on booktube and I think the hype is absolutely justified. I have previously made a sort of reading vlog about this in which I recorded my reaction to reading Rebecca chapter by chapter. Um, I'll link that down below but be aware that unlike the other videos that I've linked in this description box, this one is not spoiler free. We remain in the early 20th century for our next book, and that is The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie, which was published in 1926. Now, I haven't read many Agatha Christie novels. In fact, I've only read two, and this is the one that I'm choosing to recommend. I went into it with some preconceptions. I was expecting a cozy sort of murder, a fun detective, and a brain-achingly complex puzzle for both me and the detective to solve. And yeah, that's kind of what you get here. The book is set in a small village that runs on gossip and dinner parties, where the neighbor's affairs are the most interesting topic of conversation. The detective, the iconic Hercule Poirot, 
moves into the neighborhood and becomes the topic of conversation himself. The book is narrated from the point of view of the village doctor, a man named James Shepard, who by nature of his profession is very close to pretty much everyone in the village, which makes him the perfect companion to the detective when the local squire is suddenly found dead in what appears to be an entirely impossible murder. Throughout the book we follow the tried and tested tropes of detective fiction, though I should point out that they weren't quite as tried and tested when Agatha Christie wrote this book. Like many classics and many on this list, this is one of those novels that helped shape a genre. But to you, a modern reader, this will feel somewhat familiar. The way Poirot goes to different locations, makes observations which are revealed bit by bit to both the reader and the narrator. The way that suspicion falls first on one character, then another, then another, until at the end only one possibility remains. On top of that familiarity, there's also the engaging and often hilarious prose, the characterization which is very skillfully balanced on the line between realism and caricature. This book is an absolute joy to read. And then there's plot twists. Of course there's plot twists. I won't tell you what they are, obviously, but I did not see them coming at all. Admittedly, I'm not the sharpest tool in the box when it comes to predicting these things, but what made the twist so delicious here is that, at least in my case, I understood what was going on just a few pages before it's made explicit in the text. And that feeling, whew, that's like nothing else. I've done a full review video of this book, which I'll link, you know, where. The first part of the review is completely spoiler-free, the second part isn't, but I've marked the point at which I go into the spoilers very, very heavily. So if you are intrigued by the murder of Roger Ackroyd, feel free to watch that video up to the spoiler mark. The penultimate recommendation for today is The Crack and Wakes by John Wyndham, which is from 1953. I was a bit torn about whether to include this book or John Wyndham's much more popular The Day of the Triffids in this list. They both have a lot in common, including the apocalyptic setting and unfolding events that are detailed in the story. I love dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction. In fact, the last item on this recommendations list is a post-apocalyptic classic. But this book, The Kraken Wakes, isn't quite that. It is, I suppose, an apocalyptic novel. The world at the beginning of the book is recognizably ours, the world of 1950s England in this case, and then by the end, who knows? We follow an inquisitive journalist by the name of Mike Watson, who, with his journalist wife Phyllis, witnesses the horrific events that herald the end of the world. As the title suggests, the end of the world emerges from the depths of the ocean, in the shape of monsters that rise up from the waters and devour everything in their path. Despite this really quite bleak premise, this is a fun book to read. As fun as death and destruction ever can be, of course. The two protagonists, Mike and Phyllis, are some of my favorites ever in 20th century fiction. I adore how John Wyndham writes them. They're journalists and reporters, so they're in a perfect position to witness, record and fight the events that overtake the planet in this book. They have a natural curiosity, but they're also very skilled, they're charismatic, they're fun, and even with all the horrors that they witness, they do not lose their sense of humor or the love and respect that shapes their relationship with each other. John Wyndham's books have been described as cozy dystopia by some, and I think that's not quite accurate. They're not cozy books, but they are funny, and I think that's what people mean by that. There's a lot of humour in this one, just like in Day of the Triffids, while at the same time not shying away from descriptions of death and violence that can be quite graphic, just as you'd expect from a book like this. But the characters bring a levity to a book with such a dark premise, and it's just that blend that makes The Kraken Wakes absolutely irresistible. Do give this one a try, in particular if you enjoyed The Day of the Triffids and are looking for something with a similar vibe. The Kraken Wakes is, I'd say, compared to The Day of the Triffids, a bit more fast-paced, a bit more of a romp and adventure than The Day of the Triffids. My final recommendation is for another mid-century classic, and that is I Am Legend by Richard Matheson from 1954. This is a dark, depressing, horrifying book about the end of the world. Unlike the John Wyndham novel, in which we see how humanity reacts to the end of the world, 
there is no humanity left here. There's only one lonely man by the name of Robert Neville and his struggle for survival in a world that is overrun by the undead. Yes, this is a zombie story, even though the zombies who the protagonist suspects have been infected by bacteria are called vampires in the book. It's a bit confusing, but really they're a sort of cross between vampires and zombies in that they are on the one hand allergic to garlic and sunlight, uh, but they also seem incapable of coherent thought and are driven by pure bloodlust. In terms of storytelling tropes and genre conventions, this is definitely a zombie story more than a vampire story. And it's absolutely harrowing. The entire book is gloomy and dark as the protagonist tries his best not just to survive, but also to fight his ever increasing loneliness and to find out what exactly happened to his fellow humans or the people that he held dear in his life. This sounds like the premise for a slow paced quiet book that explores the depths of human despair, but it isn't. It's a fast paced and loud book that explores the depths of human despair, but with more stabbing. It is that very bleakness that makes I Am Legend such a gripping read, because just like Roberts, we the reader hang on to every shred of hope, every glimmer of it. We wanting, needing there to be just a sliver of joy, the mere promise of a brighter future. But will we find that? Will Robert find that? Only one way to find out. So these were my eight recommendations for page turning classics for the, uh, what did I call this video? Page turning classics for the easily distracted. And uh, even though, as I said, they're not the type of books that I normally gravitate towards, but all of these are real favorites of mine. They're all books that I truly loved and that I hope you will enjoy as well if you're not familiar to them. If you have any more classics that fall into that category, feel free to drop them in the comments and I'm sure other people and myself will appreciate those recommendations as well. This video started as a follow-up to a previous one I did in which I basically complained about the tendency of book publishers to spoiler the plot of their classics in the introductions to these books or sometimes even on the blurb on the back of the book. And that tendency, I believe, is born out of an unwillingness to understand classics as stories that keep people engaged. And so in this recommendations list, you could tell there were so many uh, books that I had to talk about in very vague terms because what makes the joy of these books is the actual events in them. So please, in the comments, be aware of spoilers as well. Remember that not everyone has read the same books that you have, but I'm sure you already knew that. Thank you for watching. Bye.